My name is Peter Hurst. I am the Senior Associate Dean for Executive Education at the MIT Sloan School of Management. It is a great pleasure, a privilege, uh, and an honor to have been invited to share with you today some thoughts uh, from us at MIT Sloan Executive Education uh, about the trends uh, in technology and learning that we have been experiencing uh, over the past few years uh, and that we're expecting uh, in the coming years that I hope will be useful to you. So let me begin uh, by sharing my screen. And so today uh, I want to talk to you about some key themes and trends that we have seen uh, as our uh, business has evolved along with uh, all of yours uh, over the past uh, two or three years and as we look into the future. Uh, once again, my role is Senior Associate Dean for Executive Education at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Uh, and so today what I'd like to uh, talk to you about over the next few minutes is first of all, give you a brief introduction uh, to the Sloan School and to Executive Education at the MIT Sloan School, just to give you a context of where I'm uh, bringing these ideas uh, from. Uh, then really, I want to dive down into four key evolving themes uh, that uh, I have been interested to observe, and I hope that you will find useful, uh, and drill down a little bit into some uh, some of those uh, themes as well. Uh, we'll uh, spend a bit of time helping you think about uh, what are the potential implications uh, of all of this for you in the legal uh, professions, and I'll leave you uh, with something of a call to action. Uh, so first of all, MIT Sloan Executive Education. Uh, well, we run non-degree short courses uh, using MIT Sloan faculty and MIT faculty. And really, we have three principal goals in running these courses. One is to help business leaders and organizations to build the capabilities that they require to address and solve transformational challenges. Uh, we really leverage faculty expertise and practical application and engagement of learners to have uh, impact for individuals and for, and for companies. Uh, so we're really about the application uh, of the uh, incredible research that goes on at MIT to help businesses and other organizations to improve. Uh, in doing so, uh, of course, we're also uh, forever trying to uh, grow the uh, organizational capital of MIT and of the Sloan School and creating relationships with different organizations and businesses around the world, uh, like the one that we're uh, talking to uh, today, of course. Uh, and through all of this, uh, it's also part of our mission to advance the field of management uh, and of executive education. And so we to be, try to be innovative in our own right, too. Just to give you a sense of scale, uh, this is for the year of uh, 2019 pre-pandemic. Uh, just to give a sense of what the scope and scale of our uh, of, of our programs uh, has been, we run nearly 50 different programs that are open enrollment, uh, either in person on campus or or, or live online uh, using uh, Zoom or other video conferencing kinds of uh, platforms over the last two years. Uh, that reaches nearly 4,000 different participants, uh, executives from all around uh, the world. Uh, we also work with companies and organizations to develop uh, programs just for those companies and see uh, well over 1,000 people uh, a year coming through, executives a year coming through those. Uh, and in recent years, we have introduced self-paced digital online uh, public programs uh, and well over 15,000 people a year are participating all around the world in those programs as well. So that really gives us uh, some great uh, perspective, we think, on what are the challenges that companies are facing uh, and how are they, uh, what are they asking uh, from us uh, that they need to know and what are they learning from us that they didn't need that they know that they need to know. Uh, we work a lot, as I mentioned, uh, with uh, companies to design uh, programs that really are strategic for those companies. It's about organizational transformation, about helping leaders, helping companies develop the leadership capabilities uh, that they need, and oftentimes launching strategic initiatives for companies uh, as well. And we work with organizations like like Find Law, uh, like hopefully uh, in the future um, uh, the the legal organizations uh, in Brazil uh, to create MIT experiences, uh, so that people can come and discover the world of MIT, or we can bring MIT uh, out into the world. And we've worked with very many companies, really globally, uh, including several uh, in Brazil. You can see a few uh, on this slide here that are listed for information. So. What I promised you is that I wanted to talk about uh, 
four key trends that we have seen uh, over over recent years. And the first and perhaps the most obvious uh, thing that we have been asked over the years to help companies with uh, is under the theme of innovation. And really the question here that companies come to us and ask is, we want to be able to innovate or we want to be able to innovate more. Uh, we'd like our people to be more entrepreneurial. Uh, we want to be able to generate ideas or generate more ideas. And ultimately, we want to get to market uh, faster and stay ahead of our uh, competition. Uh, so you know, innovation, many different ways of thinking about it. Uh, and of course, it's very, very uh, widely studied. But here are some ideas that uh, we have seen in our research around MIT and uh, we have developed in our work with, with companies uh, over several years, helping them to become uh, more innovative. And the first point, uh, I think, is uh, it's such a widely used term uh, that you know we're scientists at MIT. So first of all, I should define my terms. Uh, and for us, I'm going to say that uh, we define uh, innovation as really the process for creating, delivering, and improving uh, products and services. Uh, and indeed business models. And the first thing there uh, I would like to emphasize is the importance of the word process. Uh, innovation, in our view, is a process. It's not a single event, uh, a light bulb going off, even though I have a picture of a light bulb on this slide. Uh, it's really more of a uh, process uh, that companies, uh, and I suppose individuals, uh, go through. Uh, and one of the things about it being a process is that any process in our view can be systematically improved. Uh, and so we spend a lot of time working uh, with companies to help them understand the process of innovation uh, and improve uh, and improve those processes then so they can become more innovative and achieve all the kind of outcomes uh, I just mentioned uh, on the previous slide. Second point about uh, innovation uh, that we think is very important is that innovation, of course, is, is strategic. Uh, but my colleagues uh, at the MIT Sloan School and at MIT uh, have developed a way of really differentiating between two different kinds of innovation. There's what they call big I innovation, and there's what they call little I innovation. The big I, capital I innovation, is really uh, where we're challenging business models, making new industries, uh, creating entirely new ways uh, of, of working uh, or new product categories and so forth. Uh, very, very uh, large scale implications and very obvious, of course, and we all, all, all know what many of those examples are. But just as important uh, is this idea of little eye innovation. Uh, and that's where we get into the realm of things like continuous improvement. How do we keep improving our products and our services uh, so that they can uh, continue to be delivering value uh, for, for our clients uh, and, and for our own businesses and enterprises? One of the things that we've seen as we have really uh, dived into innovation at MIT uh, is that you know, innovation really requires what we call an ecosystem. Uh, and here's a, a little acronym, CURES, to help you think about what the different parts of that ecosystem are. Uh, of course, uh, oftentimes innovation is being driven by corporations, by companies, and the corporates have an important role to play in that ecosystem. Equally important, those corporations need a source of new technology and ideas and people uh, as well. And you know, the innovation source oftentimes you know, is a university or other kinds of uh, institutions that are really discovering and creating knowledge and, and, and training uh, people uh, as well around those, uh, those skills and those, and, the, and those techniques. Third thing uh, in the acronym uh, R is for risk capital. Uh, really, innovation requires in, in investment. And there, there are various kinds uh, of, of risk capital that we can see. Uh, you know, my day job sitting in, in MIT, uh, in Kendall Square, I'm sitting in the highest density of risk capital for innovation, probably anywhere uh, on the planet. Uh, and so even though we're working in this uh, age of uh, everything being digital and remote, uh, that kind of concentration and availability of risk capital from different kinds of providers and players is very important. Uh, and entrepreneurs, of course, we need people who have uh, the skills, uh, the willingness uh, to, to go and take these risks uh, and to put these ideas uh, into practice and develop them into uh, marketable uh, and deliverable products and services. And the entrepreneurs are really a very key element of that. And finally, there's the state, uh, the government. There is a role for the public sector to play. All of these uh, elements of, uh, of innovation actually interplay with, with, with each other. 
Uh, and we we have some really interesting research going on at MIT that uh, a number of organizations and regions and cities in Brazil, uh, for example, have participated in to help use that model. Third point about innovation. Innovation is, of course, a very much a state of mind as well. It's a culture. Uh, culture, really, we mean, well, how do we do things around here? What are our values? How do we behave? Uh, and we know around the world, uh, culture changes, but within countries, uh, culture changes as well. And even within companies and organizations, uh, culture uh, changes. Uh, and some of you may have heard this quote uh, before, the idea that culture eats strategy for breakfast. So you know, however well you make your plans to be a more innovative company, if you don't pay attention to what is the culture of our organization, uh, then really uh, the, your chances of success uh, are, are, are really uh, limited. Uh, related to that is, is this idea that innovation is a team sport. Uh, you know, oftentimes we have the idea of the lone innovator, the lone inventor, uh, some uh, mercurial character, and they certainly have existed and have played important roles. But when we look at the data, the vast majority of innovation that we see happening in organizations and in the world is really being driven by teams, by organizations. Uh, and oftentimes those teams cross boundaries between organizations. So it's not just all inside uh, my company or my team, but very much how do we collaborate? How do we work uh, with partners from uh, other industries and sometimes maybe even with competitors? Having said that, of course, uh, this is still a competition. Uh, and so one of the key questions that we re also uh, like to explore is how do you decide when to compete uh, and when to collaborate? Uh, these are all really important questions uh, around innovation. So that's innovation. And um, we have over many years been asked by companies and other organizations to help them with innovation. But more recently, of course, there's been a second uh, trend, and that is that we have been asked to help companies uh, and other organizations uh, to grapple with digital transformation. Well, what do we mean by digital transformation? Uh, and uh, I will talk about that in a minute. But the kinds of questions that uh, we get asked are, what should our digital strategy be? Uh, how should we get there? How do we implement it? Uh, what different technologies uh, should we be thinking about or paying attention to or investing in uh, ourselves? Uh, and to the extent that all businesses and most organizations have users or customers, you know, individuals or other organizations and companies that, that they uh, need to work with, uh, what kind of experience, what customer experience do uh, digital technologies enable us uh, to create? Well, let me dive a little bit into some themes uh, that we see in digital transformation. First of all, and I can't emphasize this enough, uh, from all our research at the MIT Sloan School, uh, this uh, equation that I've written here Digitized does not equal digital. Digitizing means automating your processes. And that's important. Many companies, of course, many organizations, many professions are on the journey to doing that. And you have really completed that journey. You know, all of their materials are now digital. Filing cabinets perhaps don't have paper, uh, don't exist uh, anymore. Maybe even the processes have been uh, digitized uh, in, in that sense. But we uh, differentiate uh, when we see that, in fact, doing all of those things uh, certainly has benefits and advantages. It enables you to be more efficient. It enables you to service uh, your customers better. It enables you to make use of data better, all of those things. But when you do all of those things, one of the things that uh, you will see is also the much more significant opportunity is to really reinvent your business as a digital business. And that's what we mean by digitalization versus digitization, reinventing your business strategy. And there are a lot of different tools uh, and frameworks uh, that we have and that we can help uh, different companies with to, uh, to help you think about uh, this question. But as you're reflecting on your own business, your own organization, one of the big decisions uh, around being digital versus just digitizing is thinking about, uh, are you a product-based organization or are you trying to create a platform? Are you bringing the providers of different products and services together with customers for those products and services and creating another ecosystem uh, that you're able to uh, enable uh, that? And that's really ultimately your business model. As you think about that strategy, uh, you also uh, need to think about, well, within that optimal strategy, uh, how do how do we get there? 
how do we go from being perhaps a traditional organization uh, with a lot of still uh, manual processes, uh, even if they're uh, digital manual processes, uh, like working on spreadsheets instead of working uh, in cloud-based uh, systems. Uh, what's the best way to get there? Do we try to go there a little bit at a time? Do we try to go there uh, all at once? Uh, do we try to just set up one digital business uh, and eventually let go of our, our legacy business? Uh, these are choices uh, that every organization uh, has to make. An important part of that is designing customer journeys. How do your how are you going to interact with your customers? Uh, one thing I can uh, share with you from much of the work that we've been doing with our own customers uh, and in turn helping them with their customers is an idea of omni channels, and that is that uh, actually our customers want to make their own choices about how they interact with us. Uh, and an individual customer even will move around between different channels. They might want to call us up uh, by telephone for part of an interaction with us. And they'll want to do uh, some things on our website and they'll want to uh, communicate electronically by email or by some other kind of more secure uh, channel with us. And they may be consuming our products physically. Uh, how do they get delivered into our homes or our businesses? Or they may be consuming digital products uh, from us. And so uh, how do we deliver all of these integrating across all of these channels and create and creating this kind of integrated experience turns out to be very difficult to do and very important for companies uh, and other organizations to provide the level of, uh, of, of customer engagement that's required to uh, to beat all of the competition. You know, what are some of the technologies uh, that we uh, are, are asked about, that we know about, that we have people uh, doing research on uh, here at, at MIT that we think uh, are vital to be looking at and investing in uh, whatever kind of organization you are. Well, of course, there's artificial intelligence, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. Uh, we're hearing a lot uh, from uh, the company formerly known as Facebook, for example, about uh, the creation of, of, of virtual worlds where people are going to uh, live aspects of their life and do their work. Uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies uh, are clearly uh, fashions that come in and go out uh, but there is an underlying uh, trend line of blockchain becoming increasingly useful as, in a, as an enabling technology that using these distributed ledgers, ways of not having centralized uh, data systems, but really sharing uh, across the ecosystem responsibility for managing data and processes and doing so securely. Uh, that's something that you really need to uh, be understanding what's happening and what that means for your business, for your industry. Uh, cyber resilience, the cyber security is, of course, a huge uh, issue, whether we're talking about the fundamental computer systems that our businesses rely on uh, or the way that you know the Internet of Things has made every single device uh, around us almost now be connected in some way, whether we're wearing it on our wrist or it's in our home or in our office. Uh, the, the, the security and integrity of all of the data and the systems is something that uh, we really need to pay a lot of attention to. Uh, one of the challenges technologically that to, to a lot of that is uh, the uh, uh, quantum computing, which uh, is not here yet, uh, is still in the laboratory, uh, but is getting ever closer to being a, a commercial reality. And when it is, that will br bring new challenges uh, for many uh, things, as well as new capabilities around artificial intelligence. Certainly a question of what are the implications for cybersecurity from quantum computing. And although I'm talking about uh, probably to people who are mostly uh, working in the, in the service sector, uh, let me say as well that you know advanced manufacturing, robotics, uh, are you know very important technologies that we get asked a lot about as well. Uh, and it's not just all about silicon. Uh, there's obviously a lot of technology that relates to biology and the life sciences. I've I've noted on this slide genomics. Of course, in the last uh, couple of years, we've been uh, really all affected by uh, by the uh, pandemic, but also uh, how uh, incredibly quickly uh, our life science companies were able to use many of these technologies that I've just mentioned uh, you know, to uh, enhance and accelerate the development of biological technologies uh, to help us combat uh, viruses and, 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 and pandemics. Uh, so many, many technologies that uh, perhaps a bewildering array uh, that, that one really needs to have some sense of what is going on. Uh, and a final point here about the digital transformation uh, that I'd like to make is uh, some of our faculty uh, have uh, really researched uh, 
what companies are, are doing with technology uh, transformation and made the uh, observation that these transformations, uh, they're not just one point in time. It's not a project uh, that starts and ends. Uh, and now, you've, now you're a digital company, but really it's a, it, it's a whole new way of being. Uh, and one of my colleagues uh, is, is using this term forever frontiers. Uh, and the idea is that as organizations, as companies, we need to become future ready uh, so that we're able to continue to uh, develop, invest in, adopt, adapt to new technologies uh, as, as they come along, uh, because this is not just a one-time change. Just to dive a little bit more into how important uh, this is, here's a research insight for the MIT Center for Information Systems uh, Research. And I work in a business school, so of course, I have to have a two by two matrix at some point in a presentation. Uh, and, and here's mine uh, for today. And I borrowed this from MIT Center for Information Systems Research. And what this graph uh, on the top right uh, really is showing you, uh, on the left hand vertical axis is What's the nature of the customer experience that an organization or a company has, has created? Uh, is, it, is it traditional? Uh, you haven't really transformed yet, or is it uh, you know, much more transformed? And in, in terms of customer experience, transformed really means that we've created a joined up integrated experience. So think about how you do uh, your, your banking, for example. You know, and a, a traditional bank, you have to deal separately with each department. You know, a loan is different from your insurance, is different from your savings account. An integrated experience, you have all of that information uh, available and connected uh, in 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 one uh, in one application, where you can actually easily move uh, your money around between your different accounts uh, and, and and have that integrated experience, horizontal access, operational uh, efficiency. Again, at the low end, you know, traditional. Uh, the assumption is, and this is usually the correct assumption, uh, that uh, with all the silos and the spaghetti, as computer uh, technologists like to describe these systems, uh, those tend to be inefficient. Paper-based tends to be uh, in inefficient, uh, for example. And then as you move up to the right, uh, you get more transformed uh, in terms of operational efficiency realizations. And what you can see uh, in this chart in these four quadrants is the worst place to be is in this bottom left quadrant. Uh, if you're not digitalizing at all, uh, you're both you're traditional both in terms of the customer experience and in terms of your your, your efficiencies. Uh, what this data shows uh, from MIT is that uh, in orange in 2017, in blue in 2019, uh, really, uh, the mar net margins of businesses that look like that have been dropping uh, really dramatically. Uh, let's say, okay, um, we, 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 we understand that we need to uh, try to digitize uh, and we go straight to the customer experience. You know, we want to just jump to creating integrated customer experience. How does that help? Uh, well, it's not great news. If you look at this data, it suggests that you don't, you're not losing quite as much money, uh, but you're still uh, not profitable on this timescale. And that might be because these investments are being made and they haven't paid off uh, yet. This is a snapshot uh, in time. But now let's look over to, uh, on the other hand, the operational efficiency side. If you've transformed your organization and you've really uh, improved your operational efficiency, well, that does hit the bottom line, as you can see. Uh, you actually get net improvements in uh, in, in margin and percentage points. Uh, and we, we like to say that these are companies that have industrialized uh, their processes. But the place that you really want to be, of course, is in this top right uh, quadrant where you have both uh, obtained the efficiencies, uh, the operational efficiencies from digital transformation, and you've also uh, uh, transformed your customer experience. And you can see here in the uh, more than 1,000 companies uh, that MIT looked at, uh, very significant increases uh, in net margin percentage points uh, relative, to, to the, relative to the industry uh, average. And so that's the holy grail. That's, that's where we're, we're trying to get to. There are different pathways uh, to get there. Some companies uh, try to do everything at once. Uh, some companies try to focus on one aspect of their business. Uh, some companies try to do everything at once and are very well coordinated across their business. And some companies really try to do everything at once and it's very uh, piece for, piecemeal. One thing I can say from this data from MIT, though, is that uh, if you're not on this journey already, uh, then you're really falling very far behind. 2% of companies that we surveyed uh, in this work 
uh, had not started on some kind of digital transformation uh, project. On the other hand, only you know, at best around 50% uh, had uh, truly uh, completed uh, a digital transformation journey. Uh, and so uh, while you might be late to the game, if you haven't started yet, uh, there is still plenty of time to catch up. The third trend uh, that I'd like to uh, focus on that we hear about from customers uh, and that we get demand for is, uh, given these first two trends, how do we redesign work uh, and, and, and our organizations? Now, this started before the pandemic, and of course, in many ways, it's been accelerated uh, by, by the pandemic. Uh, and some of the key challenges uh, right now uh, at the moment are, what talent do we need and, and where on earth uh, do we find it? Uh, very related to that is where, how, and indeed why uh, do we work? Uh, and from my point of view, uh, sitting in MIT and executive education, uh, you know, where, how, and why uh, do we learn? And those two things uh, we think need to be uh, increasingly integrated. Uh, the idea that uh, you go off somewhere to learn uh, for a long period of time, uh, and then you come back and sometime later, you'll, you know, many, maybe years later, you'll get to apply that. Uh, that seems increasingly uh, difficult to justify uh, because things are changing faster and faster. And so we need to be learning all the time. We need to be reskilling within uh, our careers and professions. We oftentimes need to learn entirely new careers uh, and professions. Uh, and that's something which is just a reality for all of us. And at MIT, and especially in Sloan uh, Executive Education, we believe that learning while you're working, where you're working, and how you're working uh, are really uh, vital to that. The idea of just-in-time learning versus just-in-case uh, learning. Uh, new leadership requirements. You know, what skills do we need in leaders uh, in the kinds of world that are being created from these first two trends. They're certainly different. We need much more distributed leadership. We need people at every level in the organization to think of themselves as leaders, to understand that they have responsibility, not just for themselves, but for the outcomes that the whole organization can achieve and beyond uh, the organization as well. And what kind of experience are we creating for our employees? Uh, the people that we work with, our, our colleagues. Uh, these are all really very important. So let me just reflect a little bit more on the question of how we learn. Uh, here are some examples uh, of technologies that we were experimenting with and deploying at, at MIT uh, before uh, pandemic, uh, before COVID. Uh, on the left, you can see a, a screenshot from one of our virtual classrooms in an immersive avatar-based virtual uh, world where people from all over the world can uh, come together into a virtual classroom and have a virtual learning experience. Uh, on the right, uh, you can see a video we took just a few weeks ago uh, of me. Uh, you can perhaps just see me uh, on the robot there uh, attending a uh, this is a, gra a graduation ceremony for one of the uh, executive education courses that we had on campus. 98% uh, of people who take our online and digital courses uh, at, at MIT are completing those courses. You know, that's really a testament to the uh, effort that uh, our faculty and our staff uh, put in and the attitude to learning uh, that these individuals are bringing to not only realize that they need to start a course, but to start a course, invest time and effort and other resources into it and, and to finish that course uh, and actually go ahead and apply it uh, in their work in their world. That's something uh, that, that we're very proud of. But what you really see here is the connection between the virtual and the physical. That's where we think the future is in terms of work. And that's where we think the future is uh, in terms of learning. You know, employees of the future, they're going to be data literate. Uh, we're already uh, seeing that, of course, many of us have had that forced upon us, uh, if you like. Uh, we you know we've, we, we, we're have we awash with, with, with data, but the next generations of employees that are coming through are so much more not only uh, exposed to and comfortable but with, but also literate with their data. And what do I mean by that? I mean that they're not only able to work with it. But they also bring you know, insights uh, and concerns uh, about questions like uh, like privacy. Uh, so employees of the future, increasingly, we're going to need to uh, recognize the fact that 
that they bring this, uh, they're going to bring it implicitly this data literacy. Just look at young children as they learn uh, to use digital tools and the facility with which they, uh, which way, which they do those. In fact, uh, these future generations of employees, and they're already here in our workforce now, will be much more comfortable working with artificial intelligence, machine learning, robots, and technology uh, than, than we have been ourselves. Here's a, a picture on the second uh, phone screen here of ABT, Algorithmic Business Thinking, an idea that's come from one of my colleagues at the MIT Sloan School that really looks into how do people and machines, computers, work together to be more than the sum of the parts. And what we really see there is that we shouldn't be afraid of, of robots and automations, but really these are opportunities uh, to, embr to, to, to embrace. And in so doing, uh, here's a, a third thing which uh, research at MIT suggests that employees of the future will expect. And that is that they will expect that uh, as employers, we provide good jobs. Uh, what do we mean by good jobs? Well, by good jobs, we mean jobs that people uh, are motivated by. They're excited to be doing that work. Uh, they get rewards financially, but in other ways as well from doing that work. They feel empowered. Uh, they have the ability to uh, get work done uh, and to really be collaborators and team members and not just instruments of, uh, of, of capital. Uh, and uh, work as really a collaboration. This changes the role of management. It changes the role of leadership uh, within organizations in important ways as well. And, and finally, employees of the future are going to increasingly demand social and environmental responsibility from us, their employers, from companies, from the world of business, uh, and, and, and whatever kinds of organizations uh, that, that we're in. And uh, that brings me to my uh, fourth uh, trend, that we're asked, uh, we've seen ourselves being asked for in uh, executive education programs by our clients, and that's ESG, Environment Social uh, Governance, which uh, we've heard a lot about. I have added uh, a fourth letter, R, for resilience uh, to ESG, uh, and that's for fairly obvious reasons, but you know, we can see uh, the kinds of challenges that companies are facing uh, that we have were frequently and increasingly asked to help them with, not only are now, you know, how do we uh, have greater stewardship and be more responsible in terms of uh, our impact on the environment? Uh, how are we more engaged in society? How do we ensure that we're exercising social responsibility? Uh, how do we make sure that the way that we govern uh, our companies uh, is uh, consistent with the expectations that our customers and uh, the, the people that make up uh, the world uh, expect us to uh, have those kinds of standards of, of governance and operation and fairness. Uh, but actually also, how do we remain resilient in terms of threats uh, and hazards uh, against all of those other three uh, topics? Most recently, of course, we're seeing the impacts of not only supply chain challenges because of the pandemic, uh, but equally uh, climate change uh, related uh, challenges, the droughts uh, that are affecting a lot of Europe and North America and Australia and Asia uh, right now that are really having dramatic, uh, dramatic effects. And for us uh, at, at MIT, I would say that we put all of those, uh, th th those ESG and R uh, topics under the heading of sustainability. And we look at these from a systemic point of view. We think that it is uh, futile to try to uh, think uh, separately about these uh, these questions and challenges or any of the ones that I've been uh, describing uh, in, in the past uh, 15 or 20 minutes uh, without uh, also thinking about how do they connect together and how do they relate. You can't think about uh, in a useful way, uh, the environmental impacts of what we're doing without also thinking about what are the impacts on the economy. Uh, you know, we need to be able to have a sustainable economy from a business standpoint, as well as a sustainable planet uh, from an environmental standpoint. And so the intercon interconnectedness uh, of all of these different things is something which uh, really requires a new way of uh, thinking about the world and new skills. Now, these are skills that can be learned uh, and that people can practice. Systems thinking, systematic uh, management are things that we teach at MIT uh, and uh, any of you can, uh, can read about, can take courses, can learn how to be better at those things. 
But let's just remind ourselves what what were these four uh, trends and think about what are the implications for for, for you. Now, I uh, I am not an expert in the legal profession, so I'm posing these more as questions uh, for you. But the the trends that, that that I described, first of all, how do we get more innovative? How you know the, the need to be innovative. Secondly, digital transformation. What is it? What does it mean for us? How do we do it? What are the implications uh, going to be? Thirdly. You know, what do we mean by uh, how, how, where, why do we work uh, and organize the reorganization of institutions uh, and of societies potentially as well? Uh, and fourthly, the need to look at all these from the framework of the environment, social uh, governance uh, and resilience. Uh, what are the implications uh, of these trends uh, for you uh, in the legal professions? One way of looking at this could be uh, these are all things that are happening. These are forces in the world, uh, and we're just going to have to react to them. Uh, somehow, uh, we're we're victims. We put our head in our hands uh, and worry about uh, what can we do about this. Uh, a different lens, uh, and one I'd encourage us all to be thinking about, is to think about what are the opportunities that come uh, from from these trends. As you hear about these ideas, as you dive into them during the course of this conference, where are there opportunities? to be that change, to drive that change, to be the enabler of these, of these trends. What are the implications uh, for you as an individual? Uh, are you needing a hand up or maybe you're in a position to give others uh, a hand up? Uh, you, you know, one of the things that uh, can be very rewarding uh, is, is to think about how can I help? What is, what is my role in helping those around me, my organization, uh, my nation, the planet? Uh, there are very important questions for us as individuals. And of course, what are the implications uh, for you as legal professionals in terms of uh, your institutions? Are your institutions fit for purpose in the face of these kinds of trends? Are you participating in these trends? Are you driving them? What kinds of new institutions uh, might, might be needed in the future? Or how can the existing institutions reorganize themselves to, uh, to, be, to continue to be relevant and to, and to continue uh, to have impact. I hope that you'll be thinking about all of these questions as you, as you go through uh, the, the conference uh, this month uh, with FindLaw. Uh, and I do hope that uh, as you're doing, uh, you will keep these four points in mind uh, that I'd like to leave you with. I call these calls to action because I think that they are things that we can all actively be doing uh, every day and thinking about it every day. The first of all is always remember all of these changes uh, are stacking. They're stackable. It's very hard to isolate one from another. Uh, I did it for the sake of linearity in a presentation, but in reality, uh, these changes are coming thicker and faster. Uh, if you look at the right-hand side of this chart, I've got a curve which is growing exponentially here. Uh, and, and that, of course, is one of our challenges. We have to be able to do all of these things simultaneously and respond to them all simultaneously. The second point is not only are they all going on uh, in parallel, they're also very interrelated. And so as you, uh, as you, as you make progress uh, on, the, on one of the trends, that has impacts and implications uh, for another. Uh, and so that is a recipe for complexity. Uh, and uh, the question is, how on earth do we deal with that kind of complexity? Well, what I will tell you from our experience is that uh, we see that collaboration is essential. In, in the face of such com that such complexity, such dynamism, no individual or no individual, no single organization can possibly survive alone, yet alone thrive. And so we really need to be uh, not only thinking about collaboration, we really need to be rolling our sleeves up uh, and doing the work of collaboration, which is not always uh, easy. It's often messy uh, and it really requires uh, an understanding uh, and keeping a focus on what are you trying to achieve? What problems in the world are you or your organization uh, trying to solve? And above all, it needs continuous learning. The only way uh, that you're going to stay on this curve, yet alone get ahead of it, uh, is to make sure that you and your organization are investing the time that uh, that is required to, to keep learning. And it may seem like you don't have time to do that uh, with all of these other trends going on. It's just overwhelming. Uh, but if you don't figure out how to keep learning, uh, you're going to fall off this curve. And really, your objective should be to be ahead of that curve. And I hope uh, that you will uh, indeed succeed in doing that. Thank you for uh, spending this time with me. 
uh, over the last uh, half an hour or so. I'm Peter Hurst, Senior Associate Dean from uh, MIT Sloan School's Office of Executive Education. Uh, thank you again, uh, and I will uh, bid you farewell and wish you success on your future endeavors.